This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Really fun Friday on tap because we have got some playoff basketball with a couple of games coming up for tonight. We have the Celtics and 76ers, Nuggets and Suns, and also some hockey action. Got the Devils and the Hurricanes for game number two. We're going to break down all three of those games with Tom Vecchio and talk about some MLB for tonight as well. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire, joined here as mentioned by Tom Vecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. You can find his work over at Number Fire. Tom, happy Friday to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Yeah, we've got a really fun day of sports. You know, a couple, obviously, high leverage playoff games. We have a full day of baseball. Uh, tonight's slate for basketball, I think, should be particularly interesting and obviously can indicate where the series will go from here. I am ready to go. Yeah, I think with the way the matchups worked out for the second round, it's been really fun like i know it's just the second round it's not like the highest leverage games yet but luck of the draw or just maybe like good depth of teams in the nba whatever it is like these series are cool and like as a casual fan a casual observer i'm kind of jacked about it yeah and you know this nugget suns game is obviously i would say the most interesting out of probably anything going on today like what are we going to be seeing from the suns we'll obviously get to that in a minute right um you know, I think there's obviously the whole weekend of games is going to be awesome. And I know you're into F1. It's here in Miami. It should be a good weekend. Got my Valtteri Botas hat on in, in, uh, I don't have the mullets. I could work on that next. <laughs> he has a mullet now. He said he grew it because of Australia. He's, he's Swedish. I don't know. It's weird. Or Finnish. I don't know. Whatever. He's an odd guy. Uh, but we do the hat on in honor of Valtteri Botas, who I am not betting on for this week. We talked F1 on yesterday's show. You can find that there. But also check out our Kentucky Derby podcast with Christina Blacker. That is up in the feed. You got that going on Saturday as well. 657, I believe, is post uh, for that. So check out the Kentucky Derby podcast with Christina Blacker of FanDuel TV to get her read on this year's field. Her favorite bet for uh, fan over at FanDuel Racing and much more. Get that by searching for covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. Let's start things off, though, Tom, by talking about some NBA for tonight over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Game number one here is the Celtics and the 76ers. Right now, the Celtics are two and a half point favorites. The total is 214.5. The 76ers looked lost in the first game with Joel Embiid back in game two, but they slaughtered the Celtics in game one. So I don't know how to feel about this series, Tom. It's weird. What are you seeing here for game number three? Yeah, like you said, it's really weird. And ultimately, my take is I I, I don't have a pick to win. That's what it comes down to. So my overall take for the game, I guess, is I expect the Celtics uh, you know, to, to continue doing what they're doing. From the 76ers side of things, I expect them to play better than they did in that second game. But I just don't know who's going to win. So they can put up a performance similar to what they did in game one, but still lose the game, you know, kind of get back in the rhythm with Embiid. Like you said, they looked lost out there. Wasn't a whole lot of scoring from really anyone or their team overall. So I expect the 76ers to play better. I just don't know who's going to win. And I think that this is a really, really pivotal game in telling us what we're going to be seeing because if the Sixers play like they did and look like they did in game two, this series is going to end four to one. I think that's like a, a very realistic outcome. But if they can at least show signs of life, they'll have that chance in the second home game to tie up the series. And then we're going to be in for a very long series. So I, I'm just as confused as you are. And I'm looking at a, a lot of different things. And the tough part is the way that they played impacts props too. So obviously the entire board is available, but it's tough to know you know, what do we do with Embiid? Will he play better this time around? We don't know uh, because it seems like a pretty serious knee injury that he had. So it, we're not picking anyone to win here, but anything in the prop department that you're that you're zeroing in on here? Because I think that that is equally murky as well. It is. And, you know, when I'm looking, when I'm taking a step back, I'm like, okay, the 76ers played horrible in game two. What would be their plan for game three? How do they get things going back in the right direction? Um, and I think that leads me to Tobias Harris under 14 and a half points, sitting at minus 102. You know, the first game you could say, okay, he had some points and Bede wasn't playing. A lot of players scored. But more importantly, he, he was really efficient. He was 7 of 12 in game one, and he was 8 of 16 in game two. And he really shouldn't be a primary shooter. So, 
you know, going along the lines of like, okay, what do the 76ers have to do? It's probably not getting the ball into Tobias Harris hands a whole mm-hmm. lot. He is a good player, but realistically to get their offense going, it's probably going to be a lot of Embiid. It's probably going to be a lot of Harden. And I think combined with him being overly efficient in the first two games, this is the spot for him to a regress, but also B kind of just be pushed slightly out of the offense because they need to get their stars going. So combining these two things together, not to mention the fact that obviously the Celtics have a good defense that I think this puts in a spot, like I don't care that he hit the over, you know, compared to this property right. games, we have to take those with a bit of grain of salt with his efficiency and with, and beat out of the lineup. This is the time for him to hit the under because the 76ers kind of have to go back to, I would say the basics and that's Embiid and that's hard. And, and it's not Tobias Harris. Yeah. The number is 14 and a half under is now minus one of six. I'm assuming that's still okay for you, despite it being uh one Oh two earlier. Right. Yeah. Totally okay, on board so. with the under Tobias Harris under 14 and a half points minus one of six right now. Fans of the sports book for the Celtics and 76ers under the assumption that Joel Embiid, hopefully healthier, get back to basics, get hard and more involved as well to hopefully kickstart that offense from what was a pretty pathetic Game number two. Let's talk here about the nightcap here. We got the Nuggets and one more in that game. Oh, go ahead. One more in that game. Uh, Marcus Smart over three and a half rebounds. Okay. uh, Plus 126. You know, he's a player that he averaged just over three rebounds per game in the regular season. But if we actually look back at his postseason stats over the last few years, he actually jumps up a little bit. He was the defensive player of the year last season. He's a player that is going to be all over the court. He's never going to be a massive pure scorer, but Great defender, and I think that the Celtics know and and have kind of shown, especially last year in the playoffs, and they're starting to show it this year. You know, their first round matchup wasn't entirely tough, uh, at least from a defensive standpoint. They just poured in the offense against the Hawks, but when time you know push comes to shove, and it's this time, they do a lot of great team rebounding. And with Smart's defensive ability, he knows that we see uh, he knows that he needs to contribute a little bit more despite being a guard. So I do like over three and a half rebounds from. Marcus Smart tonight. Over three and a half rebounds from Marcus Smart is now plus 124 at FanDuel Sportsbook. So a slight movement there, but still, it's not like a good value based on what Thomas is seeing here with Smart being a heavily involved piece of this defense, which he does respect for the Celtics. Let's talk now here about the Nuggets and the Suns. This was Suns minus three and a half. It has now shifted to Suns minus four, despite the fact the Nuggets have won each of the first two games here by double digits. Total is 225 in this game, Tom. So can the Suns? play competently tonight or are we turning trending towards another nuggets victory here uh i would hope the suns play confidently or competently tonight and confidently uh like i said this is probably the more interesting of the two games because if the suns lose this obviously everything be referencing stats oh when a team goes down 3-0 only you know 10 percent of whatever it is teams come back and win and obviously we know that uh chris paul is out for the suns he ha- is dealing with this groin thing. He left the previous game early. So what does that mean from their team? Uh, we should see where I'm at least I'm expecting to see Cameron Payne as the starting point guard. He's a player that stepped into a lot of playing time when Chris Paul was out throughout the regular season. We can literally look back at you know dozens of games and, and see the usage change. Of course, Durant and Booker are going to be the high usage players, the primary shot takers. I have no interest in the player prop, uh, the player props for really either of them. The points props, I think those are hyper efficient at this point in the season, especially with Chris Paul out. They're going to be so refined. I like Cameron Payne over five and a half assists. That's sitting at minus 115. He should really just really focus on being the primary facilitator of the offense. And he does have a high assist rate leading uh, one of the top four in the team when Chris Paul is off the court. And again, we're looking at a good sample size throughout the regular season when Chris Paul missed a bunch of games. So, Again, this is another team, the Suns, just like the 76ers. The Suns have to get back to basics, and that means a lot of Durant and a lot of Booker while also trying to limit Jokic and Murray, which is obviously its own task. But that really should mean that Payne is not going to be a shooter for them tonight. He's going to be dishing the ball out to the most effective scorers, basically not only on the team, but also some of the best effective scorers in the league. Do does it worry you at all that we're seeing Cameron Payne here in the playoffs? Whereas when Paul was out previously as regular season, Durant wasn't fully ramped up. Maybe they decide to go with Booker and Durant more ball handling. Or do you think that Payne is skilled enough in that area where we can bake that role in and just kind of know that that's the way they want to go? We can bake that in. It's also the rest of their lineup isn't as competent as Cameron Payne, who does right. have some experience. And more importantly, the minutes are going to be there for him. So even if he's not 
like super confident with the ball. He just needs to hand it off to Durant and Booker, who we know can knock down plenty of shots. And yeah, I, I'm not really worried about the, the playoff uh, right. regular season, uh, you know, difference. It's it's going to be campaign probably for 30 to 35 minutes tonight. All right, 30 to 35 minutes to rack up at least six assists. Over five and a half is minus 113 right now for Cameron Payne there. Anything else you like across Nuggets and Suns for tonight, Tom? I would lean on the under because I think that the the Suns have to kind of clamp things down on defense. They have to limit Jokic. They have to limit Murray. Um, you know, it should be tough with them without Chris Paul out there, but uh, I don't have confidence in taking uh, really anything else besides a slight lean on the under. Okay, so what we're looking at here for tonight is liking Cameron Payne over five and a half assists, minus 113. Marcus Smart over three and a half rebounds, plus 124. And Tobias Harris under 14 and a half points at minus 106. Let's talk now about some hockey. We got game number two here between the Hurricanes and the Devils. And the Hurricanes kind of ran away with game number one, won that one, I believe, five to one. Right now, their money line is minus 118. Devils are at minus 102. Total is five and a half, plus 114 on the over, minus 140 on the under. Tom, what are you seeing here for game two between the Devils and the Hurricanes? It's reminding me of exactly what we saw from the Devils in the first round where they lose game one against the Rangers five to one. They lose game two against the Rangers five to one. And then they kind of get their footing and come out and win the series. And I think that this is something that we could be seeing from the Devils in this round and, and no pun intended, like they just need to weather the storm against the Hurricanes and, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, kind of get their footing where, you know, the, the Canes finished off their series. They had a couple days of rest. The Devils only had one day of rest. So, and they had a travel. So a, a few different factors going into that. I'm, I'm still confident that the Devils can win this series. And it comes down to a few things. Like I said, they started off the first series slow. They're starting off this series slow. The Hurricanes, one thing that I, I think is going a little bit under the radar for them is they're actually really banged up when it comes to their forward court. Max Pacioretty and Andre Sveshnikov have been out since the regular season. In the first round against the, the Islanders, Tavu Teravainen broke his hand. He's out for the rest of the playoffs for the Hurricanes. Uh, Jack Drury returned to the lineup for game one, but he's been a bit banged up. So they're actually a little bit depleted, far, far worse compared to the Devils. So again, if the Devils can kind of get their footing, they have the offense to put up numbers left and right. And, you know, digging into like expected goals, the differential from what they scored at the regular season rate to, you know, scoring rate, you know, per 60 minutes and five five situations in the playoffs. It's such a small sample size when we're dealing yeah. with a handful of games. They're they're really, I don't want to say bad on offense right now, but they're just not scoring. So I expect them to start scoring more. So I'd lean towards the over. I also think that they have a, a much healthier team where, again, if they can kind of weather this storm through these first few games, they should be able to be healthier as the series goes on and they can win this in five, in six or seven games. So I think that, is an indication of where I'd be leaning for the Devils. I like the Devils tonight. I would lean towards the over, but ultimately my favorite prop would be Jack Hughes over three and a half shots, sitting at minus 130. It might be a little bit of juice for some people, but he's ultimately their best player. And, you know, we saw him in the Rangers series getting to five, seven, and nine shots in, in four of those seven games. So he's a primary shooter, primary shot taker. And really, if their offense is due for some positive regression, he's probably going to be the main driver of it. Does that thought about positive regression where they're getting shots off, but they're not scoring, does that put any any like, any like thought in your brain towards potentially turning towards a goal scorer market, which is more volatile and could potentially be more in line to benefit from a goal scoring situation? Or does your lean towards the over kind of cover that base for you, allowing you to go with the shot prop on Hughes over three and a half? I think the over covers that basis. Yeah. You know, we, we've seen it's the players are so different where you have these random players stepping up and scoring that really aren't expected just because they're trying to line match more. Right. They're trying to have a little bit more balanced ice time. Uh, you know, so seeing third and fourth liners score goals that we're not, you know, necessarily anticipating where, you know, Jack Hughes is taking seven shots against the Rangers in one of those games that he's not scoring. So I would just go with the over because that kind of encompasses everything. Like you said, we can capture that rather than just trying to pick one player. Yeah. The huge shot prop over three and a half uh, shots is minus 130 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. The total in this game, five and a half plus 114 on the over. Is that a, a lean for you, Tom, or is that one you feel okay betting? Um, I would I feel okay betting that one. I actually okay. really do like that. Like I said, positive regression for the Devils and the Hurricanes. If 
if there's any slip up or any player banged up, they could be, you know, they're going to be shorthanded. And yeah. that's, that's, that's not a good sign going against the devil's team. That's essentially fully healthy. Timo Meyer didn't play in their most recent game. He could be back tonight. And then that means they're at full health. Right now, the series betting for this one, uh, the Hurricanes are minus 188 because they have a game in hand. Which, right. So that makes sense. Devils are plus 152. Didn't sound like you were enticed by the Devils' money line at minus 102. Would the plus 152 to win the series be long enough, or do you think that's pretty appropriately priced? It's appropriately appropriately priced. I also have interest in it. I will also say I do have the Devils to win the series from you know prior to game one. Yeah. Uh, at minus 125, I think it was. Yeah. So... I'm almost confident enough to, after game one, I was waiting for these lines to be posted. I'm almost confident to buy back in. Okay. Um, because I, I obviously that number's great at, at plus 150 now compared, compared to where I got at minus 125. Um, so I'm I'm on board with the Devils. It, yeah, I could take them tonight. I could take them in the series, uh, whatever it might be. Okay. So check out the Devils markets. Decide which one you believe to be the best route to buying into them, whether it be the total to buy into the positive shot regression, the Jack Hughes shot prop of minus 130, whatever it may be. Anything else you like in the NHL for tonight, Tom? Uh, no, just the one game for the other series, you know, Vegas and Edmonton. It's, it's going to be tough to take unders in that, in that matchup with, uh, the offense that both teams have, uh, for Dallas and the Kraken, I would say continue to lean on unders in that series. And, you know, hopefully the Leafs can bounce back and make it a series against the Panthers, who ruined my 15-1 to Bruins Stanley Cup future. Uh, condolences. <laughs> I'll pour out some coffee uh, for you on the Bruins 15-1. to That was I, – I live in, like, the the – Boston area so a lot of sad people uh recently around here hopefully the Celtics can uh brighten people's moods but either way that is Tom Vecchio check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom find his work over at numberfire.com talking uh all different kinds of sports over there Tom I appreciate the time as always good luck to you this weekend have fun uh watching all the sports we'll talk to you again in the very near future thanks for having me Alrighty, again, check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Actually, next week on Friday, Tom will be filling in for me here on Covering the Spread. I'll be out for my wife's PhD graduation. So Tom will be with you for the full show Friday to fill in for me Friday and the following Monday as well. We're going to talk about some MLB that I like for tonight here in just one second. But first, now is the perfect time to get in the action with FanDuel Racing, the biggest horse race of the year being here. All customers can get a no sweat derby bet up to $20. That means you'll get up to $20 back if your win bet doesn't win. The FanDuel Racing app is super easy to use, safe and secure. And when you win, you get paid fast. So don't miss out. The derby is coming up this Saturday. Just visit racing.fanduel.com for your chance to win a no sweat derby bet up to $20 on FanDuel Racing. That's racing.fanduel.com. Age and residency restrictions apply. Offer valid on first Derby win wager. Refund issued in non withdrawable racing site credit that expires on 6 12 23. Restrictions apply. See terms at racing.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Let's dig in now to tonight's MLB slate. A couple money lines and a couple strikeout props I am eyeing over at FanDuel Sportsbook. And one of the money lines and the strikeout props don't mesh well. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's start things off here with the one that is a standalone recommendation. That is the Twins money line at minus 126 as they take on the Cleveland Guardians for tonight. Do you like the Twins there in that spot? This number has moved overnight, so hopefully you were somehow predicting I would talk about the Twins here and got it. I think they were minus 115 at one point, but even at minus 126, I've got value. My model is the Twins win odds at 59.5%. Their implied win odds, 55.8% at minus 126. I think a part of the reason why I'm higher than the market here is a respect for Bailey Ober. He's not a big name as a starting pitcher, but he's proven to be capable with a 3.95 skill interactive ERA across 33 career starts. So a pretty large sample for Ober between 2021, 2022, and then one start this year. He's been pretty solid. He's facing Peyton Battenfield, Battenfield. If you look at his numbers, whether it be in the majors this year in a small sample or in AAA last year, he profiles as a low strikeout fly ball pitcher. And that can be pretty risky. And it's riskier when you're facing a team that has Byron Buxton finally heating up. Carlos Correa, home run yesterday. I'm not sure if he's like 
fully back yet. The the data more inconclusive there. Max Kepler, Jorge Polanco, both healthy. Joey Gallo looking awesome so far. This Twins team, I think, is pretty good right now. So to get them at minus 126 with a decent starting pitcher, facing off with a team that, you know, has a pitcher who has some risk in his profile for sure, I think that makes a lot of sense. So showing value on the Twins, their money line, minus 126 right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. That's the one where it's a standalone. Let's talk now about the bet that doesn't mesh super well. That is the Boston Red Sox money line, which is currently uh, plus 134 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, I was talking about this before at 136, and I like Chris Sale under six and a half strikeouts. Let's start things off here with the money line, because again, these do not mesh super well. You typically want overs on strikeouts when you like the money line and unders when you like the opposing money line. That is not the case here. The reason I'm on the Red Sox money line here is I think that Chris Sale has improved since the start of the year. Start of the year, just kind of a dumpster fire, really letting up a lot of contact, a lot of fly balls. Sale, though, is a veteran. I think he recognized this. And in his start, he cut back on his sinker usage. Sinkers can be very good pitches if you are struggling with hard contact, and Sale was, but clearly that was not the remedy. Cuts back in his sinker usage, and in three starts since then, his hard hit rate allowed is just 31.3%. Those numbers tend to stabilize around 80 or so balls in play. We are nowhere near that, but he has been very good in that sample. Sale did still have a clunker in there that was against the Orioles, where he had no strikeouts, let up a, a decent amount of hard contact there, but the other two games were fantastic. I've also been... Decently surprised by Boston's offense. 120 WRC plus on the current active roster against righties this year. So the implied win odds at uh, plus 134, around uh, 42.5% or 43%. I've got Boston above 45% to win here. So slight movement towards Boston on this number. Because again, it was 136 earlier. But at plus 134, it's still good enough to me to take that. Now, it is two recommendations within the same game. So you could, in theory, decide, hey, maybe I want to do a same game parlay here and go with the uh, Red Sox money line and sale under strikeouts. I would not do that because those bets do not mesh well. Again, if I'm taking the money line, it implies that sale is pitching well and I'm taking the under on his strikeout problem. Now, this one has moved. It is now minus 102 on the under. Uh, when I was looking at this before, it's plus 104. So clearly there's other interest in sales under, but at minus 102, I still think this is a, a good spot to buy in the under here. So looking at sale, mention the improved batted ball data with the sinker not being in the mix. The strikeout marks have been mixed depending on the game. He had 11 against the Twins. So if you tell me that Chris Sale goes out here and has 12 strikeouts against the Phillies. I'd be a little bit surprised, but I wouldn't be like blown away by any means. But the other games he's had in the sample, 11, 0, and 5 strikeouts. What that says is he's volatile. And I think that what we're seeing at the 6.5 number is a bit of overconfidence in what Sale is doing. I think that there's still a wide range of outcomes here. And a wide range of outcomes is good when we're getting it at minus 102 on the under on a very large number at six and a half. I have sale projected for 5.6 strikeouts tonight. Uh, there's some good cushion here to get towards the under, even if he does perform pretty well. I think that I, I think that for me, the five and a, the five point six strikeout projection doesn't matter as much because sale is so volatile. But if you're looking at the median, I think the median outcome for Chris Sale is to have fewer than seven strikeouts, which is what we're implying here by taking under six and a half. So the bets don't mesh well to go Chris Sale under six and a half strikeouts at minus 102 and take the Red Sox money line at plus 134. But I've got value in both those numbers, so I will take both them individually as opposed to pairing them together because the synergy there is not very good. So make the bets individually. Red Sox money line, Sale under six and a half strikeouts, minus 102. I think both those individually are good bets. The final bet that I want to recommend here is in the highest profile game on the slate, the game you are all itching to bet. That is the A's at the Royals. I know you are blown away. You thought we wouldn't talk about this game, but here we are to break it down. I like the strikeout prop on Kyle Muller. Under three and a half strikeouts is plus 112 at FanDuel Sportsbook. And a lot of times when we have an under a total of three and a half, my numbers will show value in the under or the over because you're regressing kind of towards an average of four or five strikeouts for your league average pitcher. 
So when I ran this, I was kind of surprised to see value in the under on Mueller at three and a half at plus 112. I haven't projected a 3.45 strikeouts. So basically right in line with this projected number here. And it does lead to a median strikeout number of about three. So I think getting plus odds here at plus 112 is pretty attractive. Mueller has made six starts so far this year. He has had four strikeouts. So hit the over here just once so far. He's had exactly three at every other. So it's not like he's going way below this number. It's not a lot to go way below it, but he has hit the under and all but one start so far. He's facing the Royals. Uh, they've been trash so far this year to open things, uh, but they haven't been better against lefties than righties. Their strikeout rate against lefties around 21% on the current active roster. So I think we can trust what we've seen so far. We can buy into Muller being a low strikeout pitcher. And even though this number is very low at three and a half, I do still think it is the right way to go. So Kyle Munn, Muller, under three and a half strikeouts, plus 112 over at FanDuel Sportsbook, the final bet I want to go with. So to recap here, across baseball, Muller under three and a half strikeouts, plus 112 for A's and Royals. Sale under six and a half strikeouts, minus 102 for the Red Sox and Phillies and the Red Sox money line in that game at plus 134. And the Twins money line at minus 126, taking on the Guardians. That is all that we have here for today and this week on Covering the Spread. Want to give a big thank you once again to Tom Vecchio for swinging by, breaking down his thoughts on tonight's uh, NBA and NHL action. Check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. If you've got any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes. J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Want to thank you all for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your bets across tonight and this weekend. Enjoy the Derby. Enjoy the weekend. We'll talk to you once again on Monday to talk about that night's MLB slate. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 